Um, Karina Alvarez and her daughter Daniela were um, tragically murdered um, by a a weapon. Um, And um, the one of the big issues is that um, Karina had come and obtained an order of protection um, prior to this incident. And, but um, due to some, uh, some gaps in the law, as well as sometimes different ways that the law, uh, current law has been applied, um, we had a situation where the weapons were not seized, they were not taken away. Um, and so in that case, the order of protection could only do so much. So it is especially tragic because it's an example of a situation where a survivor came and did all the right things and got, you know, the help that everyone always, always questions, like, why don't, why don't you go? Why don't you get assistance? But um, because of limitations, um, she was still in a situation where um, where the person who was abusing her could um, could use a weapon and and ultimately har- harm her and her her child. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Chicago Justice Podcast and the launch of season four. We're very excited. We really appreciate you being here. My name is Tracy Siska. I'm executive director of the Chicago Justice Project and also host of our podcast. Off the cold open, you heard Danielle Parisi Rufoto, Managing Director of the Family Law and Protective Orders Division at Ascend Justice. What are we talking about today? We're, we're talking about the basis and the bill itself for Karina's bill. The bill's content of it is based off the horrific murder of Karina Gonzalez and her daughter, Daniela Alvarez. The bill is going to prioritize the removal of firearms from people suspected of domestic violence and that are having protective orders entered against them. Really quickly, if you're listening to the pod, please subscribe. We really appreciate it. If you're watching us on YouTube, smash that like button and please hit subscribe. It really helps this channel. We'd really appreciate it. One other little housekeeping note, CJP is in the process of lining up sponsors for an ordinance in Chicago that we would obviously love to get passed. We helped write it, mostly wrote it, the Police Settlement and Transparency and Accountability Ordinance, the PSTA. You want to get involved, there'll be a petition in the show, a link to the petition in the show notes below. Also, you can go to cjpnation.org. Drop us your information and you can get involved in helping us push that. The bill, ba- the ordinance basically uh, reorganizes and creates a whole lot of transparency around civil settlements and judgments involving the Chicago police. The city of Chicago pays out about $55 million a year from 2004 to 2023. It's about an average of $55 million a year. Uh, 2024 is going to be more because they settled one case of a wrongful conviction of four gentlemen and it was fifty. The five or $50 million, sorry, $50 million for that settlement. So, you know, the 24 bill is going to be outrageous if they're paying 50 million in one case. Also in the notes, our Patreon, if you want to support us financially, please follow that link and you can help us it really helps out everything we do through transparency, the litigation, the FOIAs, the research, and of course the podcast and the, our YouTube channel work. So believe it or not, Police don't prioritize, or at least haven't in Chicago and throughout Illinois, they haven't prioritized removing firearms from people who are suspected of domestic violence or having an order of protection um, entered into against, you know, entered in against them. Judges could have ordered removal, but they were hesitant to do it. And the reality is the way it worked is cops really weren't interested in removing the weapons. Maybe because there, there's so many of them are right wing and pro Second Amendment, but it didn't seem, at least to the, the domestic violence community, that they were really interested in doing it. And there's no system in set up statewide or in Cook County or any of the counties in Illinois to ju- to monitor how many um, weapons when a judge orders removal of weapon, how many of those were actually removed by the police, because what it ends up becoming commits like a civil forfeiture. There's an order to seize the weapons. They're not arresting anyone and they don't really like taking guns. And despite the fact that, hey, guns 
out of the hands of people that are committed domestic violence or are threatening horrific violence, so much so that they're getting an order of protection entered in against them, it would make cops' jobs safer, right? It would improve their working condition. Think about that and also think about how ridiculous is our criminal justice system that that's what's going on? And here's a stat that should scare the hell out of all of us and also proves how important this bill really is. This stat comes from the network. Uh, formerly, I think they were called Chicago Metropolitan Banded Women's Network. I'm going to read it to you. In domestic violence cases, a gun in the home increases the risk of homicide by 500%. That's right, 500%. Not 50% more likely. Not 100% more likely, 500% more likely. Seems like it should be a public safety priority, right? But of course, it isn't. One has to wonder why that's really going on. Okay, this interview with Danielle was recorded a couple months ago. So it was recorded previous to the United States versus Rahimi a Supreme Court ruling in which the Supreme Court ruled 8-1, to one, holding up a federal statute prohibiting individuals subject to domestic violence orders from possessing firearms. Hopefully, this will force the justice system in Illinois and all over the country to start prioritizing removing weapons from DV offenders, and order people who have orders of protection against them. It's not going to surprise you, but the lone dissenter, it was an eight to one Supreme Court. Think about how divided the Supreme Court is. It was eight to one. Clarence Thomas was a lone dissenter. Is that not crazy or what? Okay. So thank you, for, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. I will be back after the interview with Danielle. Uh, sure, sure. So um, Ascend Justice is a, a nonprofit. We provide um, legal services and also um, do advocacy work. Um, and our focus is on individuals impacted by gender-based violence or by the child welfare system. <laughs> and what do you specifically do in the organization? Yes. Um, so I'm the managing director of the Family Law and Protective Orders Division. So I oversee our family law program, which includes um, divorces, child custody disputes, um, things like that for survivors of gender based violence. And then I directly manage our protective orders program, um, which is located at the Cook County Domestic Violence Courthouse at 555 um, West Harrison. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about the background of Karina Gonzalez and her daughter, Daniela Alvarez, if I'm getting the pronunciations right? Yes, yes. Um, Karina Alvarez and her daughter, Daniela, were um, tragically murdered um, by a, a weapon. Um, and um, the one of the big issues is that um, Karina had come and obtained an order of protection um, prior to this incident. And, but um, due to some, uh, some gaps in the law, as well as sometimes different ways that the law, uh, current law has been applied, um, we had a situation where the weapons were not seized, they were not taken away. Um, and so in that case, the order of protection could only do so much. So it is especially tragic because it's an example of a situation where a survivor came and did all the right things and got, you know, the help that everyone always, always questions, like, why don't, why don't you go? Why don't you get assistance? But um, because of limitations, um, she was still in a situation where, um, where the person who was abusing her could, um, could use a weapon and, and ultimately har harm her and her, her child. You know, as a, um, previous victim of stalking some 30 years ago, okay. um, I, I remember that conversation in the police station, um, 
with the police saying, yeah, I think I'm not sure if we can keep a protective order or restraining. I don't know what it was back then, but they were like, we don't know what this is going to do. Like, yes, we can do it. It helps for the paperwork, but it may make things worse. And there's only limits, um, not, you know, limits of what can be done, especially at that point. And I was lucky the situation resolved itself um, mm-hmm. without any of those things needing done. But sadly, that was, I think, mostly pure luck. Um, yes. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I would say that, you know, compared to other states overall, we have a very good law specifically um Uh, We have several types of protective orders, specifically orders of protection, which is for situations where somebody is being abused by a family or household member. And we also have the firearms restraining orders, which are um, allow weapons to be seized from um, somebody who is a danger to themselves or others and has access to weapons. And so we we have good laws, but even they, even now, um, have some serious gaps when it comes to firearms. And um, firearms, when it when somebody is in a relationship where there's domestic abuse and they have a firearm, it increases the homicide um, risk of by 500 percent. It's it's huge it, in terms of how much the danger is increased um, when that is um, when they're when guns are present um, in these situations. OK, so can you give us a little bit a little insight in what was going on in the family's life? Because Karina and Daniela were murdered um, by Karina's husband. Yes. Who was abusive. Yes. Um, his, his was it was it a long term abuse? Was it something she had tried to get out of before? Do we know um, any of those details? There, um, there is a you know there was a relationship where there was a history of abuse, and specifically there was an incident where there was a threat that was made, um, and Karina came in and sought an order of protection and obtained an emergency emergency order of protection right after that. Um, So um, there, and when that happens, um, what what occurs is uh, pursuant to the Illinois Domestic Violence Act, um, in order of of the FOID card, which is the firearms owner ID, um, is revoked. But there are still limitations on what you know revoking somebody's legal um ability to own a firearm um can do if there aren't appropriate. Uh, if there aren't appropriate mechanisms for enforcement um, or ones that are allowed under the law. Okay. This, now we're going to get into the frustrating part. Like I love legislation, but I, yeah. I, I'm frustrated in the fact that it's 20, the end of 2023, and this mm-hmm. isn't part of the law. It isn't a prioritization right. um, from law enforcement. That's my outsider so I'm following Karina and her Daniela's murder. Right. Um, came um, legislation called Karina's Bill. Yes. Um, what? Well, what is that legislation? Sure. Want to create? Yeah, it does. A, it does a few things. So one of the biggest gaps with um, orders of protection um, comes in in to play when a firearm is involved. And as I mentioned, having an order of protection entered um, ju- automatically should result in somebody's FOID card being um, revoked. Um, and and but. The problem comes with um, when you're at the emergency stage where the person has not been given notice of uh, the order, hasn't had a chance to come into court, um, that it, it uh, I will say it's confusing in terms of whether it allows for um, uh, judges to order that those firearms be turned over or removed. Um, for the 
act has been changed several times over the years um, regarding this issue um, in terms of how and when a court in, in an order of protection can order a firearm to be removed. So, um, well, there is a little portion of the statute that still mentions being able to remove firearms at the emergency stage. The big portion of it that deals with this um, doesn't give the court the ability to uh, seize firearms or most importantly, order like a warrant for officers to go in and seize them at the emergency stage. Um, with orders of protection and really all protective orders, you usually start out by filing a petition and getting some emergency protection, and then the other person is notified and you can come and ask for a longer order. And so the big and and statistically, when someone is about to leave or leaving, has just left an abusive relationship, that's the most dangerous time for them. And that's where there's the greatest homicide risk. And so we have a situation where judges and law enforcement um, can't do everything that I feel should be done to take away weapons, firearms, make sure that someone does not have access to them when we are in this extremely dangerous period of time right after the emergency order. So one of the big things that happens is uh, the is what that Karina's bill would do is um, require firearms to be removed when there was an emergency order of protection if a judge grants it. And um, it clarifies some of that language that I mentioned. There's, you know, some conflicting language in the law um, so that we make sure that this is being applied the same way in all of our counties across the state, that judges know that they can do this. And there's a time limit on where law enforcement has to do this. Um, the other two things it does, um, which are also very important, is it um, closes a little bit of a loophole because currently um, somebody can, even, even in an order, a plenary order, a longer order that does say you have to turn over your firearms um, or, you know, uh, uh, when someone's void card is, is revoked, um, there's, a, there's um, a mechanism that lets them turn them over to someone else. Um, to to for safekeeping and and sometimes that's somebody who's in their their same home. So it really doesn't. It allows for sort of a loophole where the weapons aren't fully removed from the dangerous situation. So it would close that. And then finally, we do have a great law, a firearms restraining the restraining uh, a firearms restraining order act, which does allow for this. Um, in certain circumstances, this immediate seizure of weapons um, when someone is a danger to themselves or others. But when that law was first passed, there was very there were very limited relationships that would qualify. Um, and and so this would expand it to dating partners and ex dating partners, um, because you know, it's a, 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 a gender-based violence doesn't, you know, wait until you're married or until mm -hmm. you move in together or have a kid to start. Um, sometimes uh, people are dating someone and that person is the one who is in great risk. Um, so it expands that. So really it would make our laws way more comprehensive and clear um, in terms of ensuring that, you um, that when someone comes to the court to seek um, one of these types of protective orders, they're able to ensure that um, the person who they're filing against, who's a danger at that point, is, is does not have access to weapons. Okay, so just educate our audience. What does it take for someone in a, in a, to get an emergency order of protection? Mm -hmm. So, um. It's a court process. Um, so somebody needs, and this is um, a similar process for a firearms restraining order, or there are a few other types of protective orders in Illinois. Someone has to 
either remotely or in person, um, file a petition where they detail what has happened um, in an order of protection, what types of abuse have occurred specifically that make them feel like they need the court's protection. And then they need to file that and go in front of a judge. And so a judge hears this petition, hears the details, and makes a decision about whether or not they get an emergency order. And if so, what relief is granted? So this is not... Um, it, the process takes at least a few hours. It often takes a full day. Um, there is court oversight because the judge is hearing all of these cases and making a decision about whether somebody gets that emergency order or not. Okay, so does Karina's bill then want an emergency order of protection? I'm thinking, understand what would change if Karina's yeah. bill passes. So sure. let's say... Um, I'll use my name, Tracy. I go yeah. and get an emergency order of protection. My user, um, spouse, whatever, has weapons. Yes. Is it now anyone who gets an emergency order of protection if their abuser has weapons, the weapons are removed? Is how it is, that differ so what so what happens now? is um it is a an option for that the judge can check. It's a it's a um an order of protection is a is a um a collection of remedies right so there's all orders are not the same so um the person would have to request it and the judge would have to grant it however um that the judge can order that the firearm be removed when the sheriff or law enforcement go out to serve the person with the order of protection so what currently happens is um, somebody gets an emergency order, their service of process. Um, so the sheriff goes out and serves somebody. And sometimes they let them know their FOID card is revoked. Sometimes um, they ask or let them know that they can't have a FOID card and they need to turn in weapons. But there's no real enforcement mechanism and um, this changes that. So it makes it so that um, they they have to um, seize weapons at that stage. And again, this is very much, um, this is very, um, a very dangerous stage. Um, so we don't want somebody to get served and then, um, you know, still have access, still have those weapons in the home. And it also clarifies some language that allows a judge to actually issue a warrant. Um, and that is important because even if the sheriff is going out right now and in good faith saying, hey, do you have any weapons? You need to turn those over. That doesn't account for situations where somebody um, does not have um lies and says no, or especially if somebody doesn't have legal weapons to begin with. And this is a huge, huge issue. A FOID card is is your gun license. So if someone has a gun license, that can be looked up, that can be researched and, um, and addressed. Um, but if somebody has an un it has guns and they don't have a license and they're, they have those weapons illegally. Um, there's no mechanism really for anyone to know that other than the survivor who's in a ton of danger. So this uh, also allows a judge to issue a warrant. Um, and, and that is huge in terms of creating the safety. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, and we currently have a firearms restraining order which allows that to happen, but um, uh, the firearms restraining order, otherwise known as a FRO, has very limited relief. It's very specifically focused on removing access to weapons. Well, often when somebody comes in to get an order of protection, they need a lot of different relief. Um, they need they need that gun removed. They need weapons out of that person's hands to keep them safe, but they also need, um, they need the person to stay away from them. They need the person not to try to go pick their kids up from school. Um, they need all of this, this relief. So we have 
theoretically somebody, you know, needing to go get two different types of orders to really cover um, what they need and want um, to happen. Okay, so help me understand the politics of this and who's at play. Yeah. This seems really logical to me. Mm -hmm. So why had this happened? Is this a before? Like, why are all these things seemingly separated? Is this a bureaucracy issue? Is this an advocacy issue? Is this an issue with um, the NRA in Illinois or whatever version of that Republicans in Illinois? Why hasn't this become a thing before now? Yes. Um, so I think um, a few reasons. I, I think that whenever there are efforts, um, and as we you know are seeing now in, in the U.S. Supreme Court, whenever there are, are efforts to um, to restrain someone's access to weapons, that raises um, some hackles, and um, we have you know a lot of pushback, but. I think that most people can agree that if somebody is threatening and abusing someone else, um, that 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 makes them a danger to that person. And again, statistically, it's it's mm -hmm. you know obvious. I also think that this is an area. I know this is an area where a lot of different systems and agencies need to work together. So. Um, we have the court system. We have law enforcement. We have. Um, the sheriff's office, which is law enforcement, but also primarily handles service of um, civil process. So service of different court cases. So we have all these different groups. We have the Illinois State Police that keep track of all these records. And so it is making sure that not only do the law say these things are going to happen, but we have very specific um, steps um, to make sure that they are happening. So that, you know, uh, detailing that this happens at the stage where service of process is happening is huge. Um, allowing judge and just dealing with the, the practical nature of, of things. Um, so, you know, um, it is to some great and then sometimes help sometimes helpful that somebody um is void that somebody's void card is revoked when an order is issued. But if somebody has weapons illegally, there is that essentially does nothing. Um, so um, it's really making sure it, it, it really took getting together um, a cross section of everyone who was involved in this process to identify the gaps and figure out why those gaps are happening, why things are not um, not uh, being enforced the same way or not orders are not being issued the same way in different counties and then figure out a process to make this all work better. So without getting into the politics of like the FOP and their lobbying, yep. we'll get to that in a minute. Our local, what have you heard, had feedback or pushback from local police departments throughout the state or the sheriff's offices? Yeah, I mean, does someone in your position view them as cooperative for this or is this something because of their personal yeah. politics this is something many police officers are just against so they're going to kind of i you know um, slow roll it anyways right i think it, it i would say it varies greatly because um uh we often work with law enforcement particularly sheriff's offices and the, the state police who want things to be done in a safe way that protects everyone, including their own law enforcement officers. And domestic violence calls are, are dangerous calls for law enforcement officers to go on. So um, if weapons are removed from those situations and they're done in a way that is safe and planned for, um, that can decrease the danger to their own employees, their own officers as well. So that is one big thing. The other thing, though, is this varies greatly across the state. Um, just to give you an example, I've heard of judges in other counties writing in or trying to write in exceptions to the current on the current order saying that somebody can keep their weapon for certain purposes and that's just not enforceable <laughs> because 
the the FOID, it, currently it's in the FOID card act where it says that somebody um might be uh somebody's uh it says that somebody's FOID card um so therefore their ability to own weapons is revoked well okay you can't undo that by process by writing it in an order but so some you know uh some officials are very opposed to this idea and other people think it's um you know a common sense measure um to ensure that that people are not un uh, unnecessarily put in more risk okay who are your political opponents in the state sorry Who's, who are your political opponents in the state who's who is against um, this bill I can't speak to that um, personally, exactly who is, you know, like with naming um, specific names, but it definitely is is a situation where we do sometimes see pushback from law enforcement groups. And we absolutely um, uh, have, you know, like gun ownership, gun rights groups who get concerned whenever there's um, an effort to restrict. Right. It, it's always blown me away. And I've gotten in these discussions for years with you know, many officers who are pro-gun ownership. And then I say, well, what is the most dangerous call you go on? Well, domestic violence. I'm like, then why do you want guns in every house unlicensed? No one needs a license, right? In some of those states. Why would you like to not know there's a gun in the house you're going into? I don't understand that. How you, you're a yeah. supervisor. How does that make the officers you're supervising safer? And then, of course, they can't answer that. So, right. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't know. It's, it's, um, again, this is a process where there is, um, there's a court procedure, there's judicial oversight. Someone is making, um, these decisions. Someone is making a decision whether to grant the order to begin with or not. And so, um, and so, it, but it's also, you know, as I said several times, like we have the statistics to back it up. It is having these weapons very, very much increases the danger for survivors. And it also creates danger for law enforcement officers. So this seems to me like a fairly now um, fairly easy um, answer, a fairly easy uh, situation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it logically it flows, but um, yeah, I mean, especially if police are, police are for preventing crime and preventing right. homicides and, this and, is, and this violence, is, you would think yeah, absolutely. they'd be for that. Absolutely. And this is crime and this is violent crime. And this is crime that, um, I mean, it involves innocent people being harmed but in this case especially it involved a child um and sometimes uh domestic violence situations also spill over and um create or inflame tensions that already exist and create community violence so it, it's really um it's really important to do what we can to um to keep people safe and um I've been practicing in this area for uh for some time and it's one of the huge things that stands out. Um people say things like, "Oh, well, you know, an order of protection is just a piece of paper." And I, I don't know that that is true in a lot of situations it can do a lot of very strong things. It can do a lot of very helpful things. But if we are leaving somebody who we know is a danger and has a weapon, and just not doing anything to correct that situation, then we're we're making it um, not helpful. We're making it not useful for the survivor, and it can be. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just a piece of paper. But like, all right, well, you have a solution. Let's hear it. But right yeah. now, this is what we got. It even if you don't like them, it's like this is what we've got. Um, yeah. And you guys say it's always the same people who say that are ones who complain about. The, the, sir, yeah. the victims of homicides in these incidents that never went and got help. And they're like, well, why didn't you get help? Well, yes. I did, but you, you, you discounted. Yes, the way no, I ex exactly. And that's one of the things that makes us most fr frustrating is that, um, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding still about 
domestic violence and why people don't leave abusive relationships. Um, but, and what people do, you know, why people don't do the things um, that they're supposed to, quote unquote, supposed to do to get assistance. This is an example where somebody did all that. They went and they got help and they went to court and they were successful in obtaining an emergency order. Um, but it didn't ultimately make them safer um, because of some of these gaps. And it also is a situation, I think, um, you know, I mentioned dating and um, leaving an abusive relationship. One common misunderstanding is that if somebody leaves, everything will be fine. You leave the relationship, that's going to stop the abuse. And um, often it does the opposite. It makes the abuse worse. It makes the abuse more severe. So that is often when somebody's coming to court to seek help. It's when we know statistically that they're in the most danger. And so what we really want to do is make sure that during that period of time, they have protection. And that is why we have emergency orders that can be granted without notice. The whole system is set up to provide protection. But then if we're leaving weapons out of this, or we don't have you know, clarity on what can be ordered in terms of weapons or how they can be, um, how, how uh, orders can be executed, uh, then we're just, we're leaving this, again, huge, ridiculous um, gap. Um, and we're not, we're not. There are 14 other states at this point that have similar relief. This is not something where we're, you know, proposing something off the wall or that is, um, you know, really unusual. It's, it's again, it's a very common sense measure to, um, to, to increase safety. Okay. Last question. What's the current status of this bill? We are um, at, at the the domestic violence um, community is continuing to um, do everything we can to push this bill through. Um, you know, calling our legislators, um, planning um, larger days of action um, to get some action um, as soon as possible. This is a truly, you know. Uh, serious and um, pressing issues. Yeah, sure. It's life and death bill, as I would yes. call them. Okay, well, Danielle, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thanks again to Danielle. We really appreciate her sitting down with us. Any dissent, anyone not wanting to pass this bill in the General Assembly should be voted out. That's it. They should go. It's appalling that this could be something that legislators, that criminal justice officials, that criminal, that judges, that police officers on the street in any beat throughout Illinois, throughout the country, would fight. It's literally lives hang in the balance. How we could let people who have at least arisen to having an order of protection put against them, if not worse, keep their guns when they're in either a serious threat to commit violence or already have committed serious violence and they get to keep a gun. It's mind blowing, isn't it? Um, it's also mind blowing that the judges won't take um, the steps they need to, to make sure it's happening, that the criminal, that police in the, in our, you know, on the streets in our communities are not, being forthright and doing, living up to their responsibilities. It's really, it's the whole thing is sick. You would never think this would happen in 2024 in the US, but it is. Okay, so next week we have Dr. Eric Pisa from Northeastern University, professor of criminology and criminal justice and director of the crime analysis initiatives. We're talking shot spotter and you're not gonna believe this, Probably for maybe the first time, really, we have real science proving it doesn't work. And remember, when you talk about it not working, don't look at the moved goalposts. It was supposed to easily detect the difference between other sounds in the communities and fireworks or something and gunshots. Filter that all that extra out and only send cops to... Where gunshots had just occurred, 
pinpoint to position and lead to higher clearance rates, higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to be surprised. Spoiler, it really doesn't do any of that. And we have the science to do it. Science to do it, to prove that it's not doing it. All right, thank you so, so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Remember, if you want to get involved in that ordinance or anything we're doing, cjpnation.org, link is in the description. Have a good day. I'll see you next week.